Hi, my name is Ruby Powers. I'm with the Powers Law Group, a full service immigration law firm in Houston, Texas, and we're here to give you the weekly update and all things immigration. So, what have I been up to? Well, this last week I was chairing the Law Practice Management Conference for the American Immigration Lawyers Association in DC, and then most recently went to a legal tech law practice management conference in San Diego, got back, uh, what's today? I think Wednesday night. So a um, lot of learning, taking in a lot of practices to help improve the firm, customer service uh, for our clients and help um, share ideas with other attorneys and professionals to make the best experience for our clients. So I'm excited to be back and had had that opportunity. Um, so this week in news, well, the federal appeals court qu questions the indefinite detention of, of migrants, which is great because they should question it. Um, a federal appears, pa appeals panel appeared to take issue on Tuesday with a decision by the Trump administration that could subject immigration, immigrants to indefinite uh, detention. The challenges to a ruling announced by Attorney General William Barr earlier this year that some asylum seekers who establish fears of returning to their or origin countries and are subject to deportation cannot be released on bond by immigration judges. Um, so this is continuing uh, to, to be fought in litigation. Um, we had been seeing in the last year or so that it was very difficult for some um, people to apply to qualify for bonds or parole and even with a case we have this week we were offered a bond but then um, it's very difficult for clients to come up with the seventy five hundred eight thousand ten thousand dollars to get out on bond it has to be paid in full um, by a U.S. citizen or legal permanent resident um, it's a lot of money. Most Americans wouldn't be able to put together that much money so quickly. And if they don't, then um, they won't be able to get out on and take their case in a non-detained court. So we'll continue to monitor that. Um, uh, man, this is really devastating. Um, according to a Washington Post article from just yesterday, Trump administration is testing rapid review deportation process in Texas. Um, Robert Moore. We've worked with him before, right. Um, and I think he's covering a lot of the border. Um, the Trump administration has begun testing a secretive program here that aims to speed up the deportation of asylum seekers and in, in migrants, and this is in El Paso, after they cross the U.S.-Mexico border. The pilot program, known as Prompt Asylum Claim Review, streamlines the asylum process so that the, the migrants who are seeking safe refuge in the U.S. will receive a decision in 10 days or less. The accelerated review seeks to accomplish two Trump administration goals, one, deterring migrants from attempting to cross the U.S. border, and two, by pushing asylum seekers out of the U.S. Um, El Paso is the only place where they're testing this, which started this month, um, and the ACLU, American Civil Liberties Union, I said the administration's pilot denies asylum seekers due process and highlights the limited role a lawyers can play. Lawyers can, are not allowed to meet with their clients in border patrol stations and are limited to brief conversations by phone. The new Trump administration policies make it difficult, if not impossible, for non-Mexican migrants to, to pass a credible fear interview if they do not seek asylum in the first country they pass through after leaving their homeland. Um, in which we've been we've been also seeing, and that's part of my next p article. Um, so the they're often in this pilot program of ten days, they would have to be able to speak with an attorney within the first day of of entry. Um, if an asylum officer finds the migrants cannot meet the standard, the migrant can ask to appear before the judge. The migrants are then processed for deportation or moved into custody of ICE, depending on the interview's findings. Um, so, it would the basically we've seen um, that people normally would come in; they would have a credible fear interview. Depending on the results, they'd be eligible for a bond and then be released if if they could go pro through that process and do their case outside of immigration court. But now, be a combination of remain in Mexico, where people have to go back, go to Mexico and wait, or if they are put through this rapid process, then their whole hearing would be over and there would be nothing to wait for. But the thing is, is that in 10 days, if that's what they're really trying to do, um, 
attorney can't put together a case in 10 days. They can't be available. Sometimes it takes a whole 10 days for an attorney just to be available for a consultation. And, you know, what it's really striking is a lot of people don't understand. It, it can take a good 50 hours or so to put together um, a strong immigration c case, and it's definitely hindered by a person being uh, detained or inaccessible to their attorney. So, um, you know, Remain in Mexico was started in California. It was first announced in December of 2018, and then it's expanded. So if this policy in El Paso is um, something that they're planning to do in other ports, um, uh, then we need, to we need to fight back on this because there's no way a person's going to be able to have a fair chance uh, preparing their case in just 10 days. Um, so moving on, this is related to asylum as well. Um, the U.S. is close to implementing an asylum agreement with Guatemala. And this is basically regarding the third safe country. And it goes like this. If they can f prepare this relationship, they can develop this um, well, I'll go ahead and just read this and then I'll summarize it. But the Trump administration is close to implementing an asylum agreement with Guatemala that would limit who's eligible for asylum in the U.S. The agreement, which President Trump announced in the Oval Office in July, is part of a concerted effort by the administration to curb the flow of asylum seekers in the United States. And uh, the accord commits Guatemala to extend asylum to migrants who seek it. The U.S. will begin transferring some asylum seekers, migrants, to Guatemala to seek protection. It's unclear how many people Guatemala will accept and how many will be subject to transfer. Um, the Guatemala... So what's, what's important to note is that with all of these arrangements that they're making with other countries, the United States is making with other countries, for example, Guatemala, then if a person were not to seek asylum in... Guatemala, and they had passed through Guatemala on their way to the United States, then they would not be eligible for asylum. So there's sort of like a couple of points. One, it's making people go to the countries that uh, are having a, a relationship or a quarter treaty with, or, or an agreement. It's an agreement because we have to be careful what or what it actually is. It might not actually be a treaty um, with the United States in this regard for a third safe country. Um, or a safe country, but also it makes it, um, if they go to the other country, they would have to wait there. Um, in many cases, like we're seeing with Mexico, the Remy in Mexico, it's not safe for them to be waiting in Mexico. So we'll, this is becoming, I mean, the, ultimately the whole goal is to keep, try to prevent, as like we said in the other articles, from asylum seekers from coming to the United States and make it more cumbersome that they had to apply in other countries um, and that they um, you know, really won't have an opportunity to wait in the United States while they're trying to put on their case. Um, so moving on to an employment matter, right now there is a bill before the Senate, I believe it passed the House already, um, that is called the um, FAIR let me, the Fa Fairness for High Skilled Mi Immigrants Act of 2019, um, which would in effect get rid of the country quotas for the employment based um, visa bulletin. So all people who are applying, um, regardless of their country of origin, would have the same weight based on the category that they're applying. Um, there's strengths and weaknesses to this. Um, there's arguments for and against it, but overall, um, it, it's moved through the House, and we'll see what happens in the Senate. Um, and in another article, but related, it's similar, um, it talked about how the U.S. needs more of India's and China's best and brightest. Um, this is a Bloomberg article, and it talks about from this week, and it talks about how H-1 workers are important to national prosperity prosperity and the program is under threat from the administra Trump administration. Though visas normally expire after six years, the H-1B effectively functions as a trial period for those high-skilled Im immigrants. And that's really true. I mean, a lot of people come, um, there's six years, and then if they have a green card pending with um, a perm in the, in the background, um, they can continue it for one year at a time. So they could even be here for longer. Um, but we've seen a path, you know, from coming in for an F1 and then 
a student visa and then H-1B and then potentially for a green card. Um, in a 2010 study, they found that when H-1B admissions were increased in the 1990s, patents attributable to the people to people with Chinese and Indian surnames increased, while patents by people with Anglo-Saxon names didn't didn't fall. H-1Bs help native-born workers, allowing more H-1B workers raises wages for native-born high-skilled U.S. workers and doesn't hurt their employment levels. Um, so this article goes into how basically it encourages and fosters growth and improvement, and it can't just hasn't proved to necessarily take away um, American jobs. Um, and, you know, we've seen that with the uh, Trump administration's Buy American, Hire American, many companies have been disheartened with the employment immigration process and have tried to move some of their operations or employers offshore, um, unfortunately. So there will be, um, that is basically a quick summary of this week's news. I think that's about most everything that's big that's happened this week. Um, I'm also updating you. I'll be speaking at a local university on immigration this Saturday um, about trends. I'm also going, um, Nadia Khalid, one of our attorneys, will be speaking on immigration um, on October 30th. I will be speaking at the Heights Rotary Club on immigration around lunchtime on October 30th. And we will be ha upcoming celebrating our 10-year anniversary, as well as um, on November 17th, I'll be speaking um, at a rally with na the National Organization of Women on regarding um, detention of immigrants, um, especially focused on women and children. Um, I think that the other point was that um, the my book came out um, about in the last month. So build and manage your successful immigration law practice without losing your mind. And we've been doing some book signings and events around the country and CLEs. And it's been a great success and very excited to share my advice and book with the book. Um, so, you know, it's um, Friday, basically almost Friday evening, afternoon. People are on their way home or going home soon. Stay warm. It got a little cold here in Houston. Um, and, you know, I know I don't usually talk about sports, but, you know, we're, we're rooting for the Houston home team. We'll go Astros. So um, have a great fall festival-ish weekend. Actually, another point is that October is not only Hispanic Heritage Month, but it's also Domestic Violence Awareness Month. It's also uh, Women Small Business, Women Owned Small Business Month. And so I'm grateful for these awarenesses so that people can um, know about these things, acknowledge them, and, and sort of, you know, do events and, and take time to just sort of reflect on that. So I'm excited to be a woman-owned, owning a, anyway, whatever, I own a small business and I'm a woman. <laughs> um, so I, I didn't even know we had a month for that. Uh, I found out this week when I was at a lunch. So that was really <laughs> sort of funny. But um, anyway, it's always great to help uh, share the, this news. Um, you can always reach us at 713-589-2085. We're here most Monday to Friday from 830 to 530 Central Time. And you can also find us on rubypowerslaw.com, and most of our social media is available somewhere on our website. Um, we're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, the web, LinkedIn, you know, and whatever else is out there. But um, thanks for watching. Again, it's Ruby Powers with Powers Law Group, and have a great weekend. Thanks.